Good morning and welcome to another edition of Saturday Morning Coffee with Back to Basics Dog Training. Oh, I needed that. Well, again, good morning and thank you for joining me this Saturday and every Saturday here on Back to Basics uh, YouTube channel, Facebook page, Remember Me Rescues pages. Uh, I appreciate you guys being here. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the head trainer, Leon, at Back to Basics Dog Training. And each and every week I bring you this live free Q&A dog training session. So any of your dog training concerns, um, this is the format for it. I answer all questions. There are no questions off limits. I answer anything that comes out my way that I can answer. Um, if I'm not sure, we'll figure it out together. Um, with that being said, anybody watching now live and in living color, you know, please make sure you just shoot me a comment. Let me know you're here. Let me know where you're watching from. And if you're watching later on on the replay, do the same thing. I'd like to see some people come afterwards. I got a couple comments this week on the replay, which was great to see that people are actually paying attention even later on on the replay and hopefully getting some value, valued information from the stuff I talk about. Uh, with that being said, I'm going to mention this a couple times throughout the broadcast. Next Saturday, I will not be recording. Good morning, Kathy. How are you? Um, I will not be here next Saturday. Good morning, Michelle. Um, New York City in the house. Um, I won't be here next Saturday. I'm going to go participate in a dog event down here in the Carolinas. Uh, it's the first one I'm going to participate in, so it's going to be interesting. But it's Saturday between 10 and 2 or something like that, so I'm not going to make it. Uh, the good thing is, is the following week. For anybody who's watching this part of the rescue world, the foster, and the rescues themselves, the volunteers, I'm going to be interviewing one of my customers, another customer. And according to this, I lost my stream, so I hope you guys are still there. Um, let me know if I'm still broadcasting. Hopefully I am. Um, if um, So the customer I'm going to be interviewing rescued a dog from a local long island shelter that was in there for three years guys so that's going to be that's going to be huge um to tell you that even though the dog you're back i'm back okay cool thank you thank you thank you um so i don't know what you got but basically in, in two weeks because like i said next week i won't be broadcasting um i good morning jacqueline how are you um Cindy, thank you. Kathy, thank you. Michelle, thank you uh, for letting me know I'm still broadcasting. Um, so this dog that we're going to be, the customer I'm going to be talking to, like I said, her dog was in the shelter for three years, guys. And, you know, we did some work with the dog. The dog had to learn some rules and manners and boundaries and limitations, the whole nine yards. Um, so it'll be really, really, I, I hope, a very good interview, especially for the rescues and and people in the rescue world please share what i posted out i won't be posting it out till next saturday or sunday uh, i'm going to try to post it out and get it out there early i want as many people to to watch this one because this is crucial there's you know dogs that we know that are in shelters for years and years and years and people give up on them because they've been in there so long and you know this 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 dog hope that we're going to be talking to her mom um shows you even though the dog's been in the rescue for three years it it is a beautiful beautiful thing that we were able to have this dog coexist in in our world out of the shelter after three years of being basically penned up so with that being said guys waiting for the questions to pop in hopefully we get some good ones um today i want to talk about something that i know we talk about i talk about it sometimes i don't think i hit i stress it enough is um, Kathy says, I always have rescue dogs. My do boys are going into gas chambers in Georgia. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's something I've learned down here in the South, but gas chambers are popular. Unfortunately, a lot of the shelters down here do do that. And I do believe all these dogs have a, have a, a great, great chance of survival. If, we, if, if I can get, if we can get everybody who interacts with the dog once they're unfortunately either dumped or left at the shelter or thrown out on the street, whatever the case may be. Um, if we can get all the people that either work at the shelters, volunteers, fosters, rescue, get them all on the same page. These dogs have a huge chance to survive. There's no reason to be euthanizing so many dogs. Of course, let's face reality, guys. This is, you know, the Bob Barker moment here. Spay and neuter your dogs. 
so we don't have an overpopulation. Uh, that'll go a long way to stopping a lot of this and the heartbreaking stories that we read about. You know, go on Facebook. I'm part of a bunch of rescue groups on Facebook, and I, I every day I see, you know, red alert, red alert, red alert. Dogs going to be euthanized in 24 hours. Um, and it's not fair to the dog. They didn't ask for any of this. He will be 14 tomorrow. God bless. Um, happy birthday. Um, you know, these dogs didn't ask for this. We brought them into our homes. We, you know, people give them up for whatever the reason is. Usually to me, it's because people are lazy. Um, but if we take the time and we teach not only the people that are going to adopt these dogs or is teach the fosters, teach the rescue people. Um, one of the things I'm going to be working on, hopefully sometime towards the end of May for anybody involved with rescue is I'm going to be doing a seminar down here where I'm going to invite all the local rescue groups. Uh, and we're going to talk about how the fosters and the rescues and the volunteers can help these dogs move forward in their next phase of their lives to get them out of these, these situations. Uh, and it starts the moment these dogs are brought into whatever situation they're being brought into and it starts before they get adopted and that's what i want to drive so that's something i'm going to be brought doing a live with an audience studio audience whatever you want to call it and i'm going to open that up live on the facebook platforms youtube platform uh any of the rescue groups that want to link that live into their facebook page i can share a link They'll let us do it, and we're going to take questions not only from the studio, the, the audience we have. We're going to take audience, uh, questions from people on the, uh, you know, around the country, hopefully. So that's something we're going to post out there. So, guys, when you see it, we got to get it out there. Get the word out because, you know, we all know my saying, together we can help one dog and one family at a time, and this is the beginning of it. This is where, hopefully, this world of this Internet gives me the reach to thousands and thousands of people to start spreading the word the common sort of word, uh, how we can help these dogs move forward. It's a passion of mine. Um, I'll tell you now, rescue dogs have a huge potential to help this world. Uh, I'm working with a rescue dog down here. Um, wasn't in the shelter that long, but it's, it was a pup under a year old. We're thinking, um, that we're going to make into an emotional support animal. And that's basically going to be based on calm. Because there is no tricks to emotional support animals. I mean, it's a legitimate thing. The person who adopted the dog does need an emotional support dog. Um, and we're taking a dog out of a shelter. And we're going to make it into an emotional support dog to help this gentleman in his everyday life. Instead of being alone in an apartment, he has a companion. Instead of, you know, when he goes into stressful situations or whatever it is, he has somebody with him. Uh, this dog is going to do real, real good. Um, they are the best. Have a girl who just turned one. Absolutely. Rescue dogs, guys. You know, I understand people, you know, there, there's a huge misconception that rescue dogs are all problem dogs. Not all of them are. And even those problems that I've seen in different shelters and different rescue groups aren't problems. They're misunderstood. Um, and, and that's what people have to start understanding is you go into a, into a shelter and you look and you get some dogs jumping all over the cage, barking, seems like they're aggressive. They're making, they're very vocal or whatever. doesn't mean they're aggressive guys. You know, yes, dogs will bite if they're scared. They could be scared, they, you know, but we can work them through it. And that's the reason why I do these live platforms every week is to help us work through these things. Um, you know, and I understand people want to buy, go out and buy the dog, get the dog, a puppy from a puppy and they want to train them and they want to do all this. And, you know, if I get them from a, a breeder, we don't have any of the bad history, whatever, whatever, whatever. It, it, it's not necessary. Um, I'm not saying don't buy dogs because I'm not that person, but I prefer you to rescue. Um, but if you get a dog from a puppy, that means you train from a puppy, even if you get it from a breeder. And the reality of it is, I've seen it enough times in this country, the breeders are all about the almighty dollar, and a lot of them don't put the ethics into breeding that they should, um, and I've seen a lot of bad breeds, and, you know, at one point Dalmatians, be, you know, used to be a very good nutty dog, um, the movie 101 Dalmatians or the Broadway play won some sort of award, everybody wanted a Dalmatian, and all of a sudden, six, seven, eight years after that, I started seeing, 
a ton of Dalmatians with issues. And if you really go back and you backtrack it, you'll find out it was unscrupulous breeders just doing it for the buck. They got, oh my God, people want Dalmatians. So I'll start breeding brother and sister cousins together and all this. I don't care because once I get the money, I'm clean of it. And that's so uh, it's still buyer beware when you purchase a dog. There's also services that I know I offer. Um, I don't know if other trainers offer, so I won't say that, um, where I call it the matchmaking service, which is a service where I go around and I try to find the dog to match my customer's energy level because that goes into it. That's a big thing. Energy has to match energy. If you're a couch potato, you don't want that high energy dog. If you're a person that's very active and wants to go hiking and bike riding and do all this stuff, you probably don't want to get an English bulldog. Um, it's not going to be the right energy for you. Uh, so that's just something, you know, I know I offer and I'm assuming some other trainers probably offer the same thing. It makes your job easier. takes the emotions out of it for you guys going into a, a shelter or whatever and looking at all these dogs and want to take them all home. Um, so what I was going to start this conversation with, and this is good because this is going to be a huge topic. Like I said, I'm planning on it. Hopefully at the end of May, I got to work out some final details. Uh, how we're going to do this and produce it and get it out there so I can stream it while I'm talking live on stage. Um, but like I said, if you're involved with rescue, you're involved in that thing. When I do post that, that's something I'm going to put out to the hundreds of rescue groups that I'm part of on Facebook. Anybody who wants me to give them the link. That they can post that on their Facebook page to get more people involved, more people hopefully asking me questions. Um, the more dogs we can help, and together we can help one dog and one family at a time. And it's a, a sincere goal of mine. So getting back to what I was going to start the conversation with, which is the consistency and the time of training. You know, I know I talk about um, rewarding the calm, rewarding the calm, rewarding the calm, stop rewarding the wrong states of mind. And it's very frustrating. The biggest complaint I do get is my dog is a horrible, horrible walker. It reacts to everything. Um, reacts to people, dogs, cars, bicycles, skateboards, whatever, whatever, whatever. And they're not quick fixes. And what I learned, and I'm going to use a dog that I worked with specifically on Long Island, who was the opposite of some dogs with cars, where some people, dogs go after cars, but it's the same concept. This dog was terrified of the cars coming down the street as they were walking to the point where it would literally try to drag the people 20 feet away from the road. Um, and it was one of the worst cases I've ever seen of a dog being that terrified of cars to the point where even if we walked between two cars that were parked on a driveway, this dog was, would shut down. So my normal instinct is, okay, we're going to bring him out to, her out to the road. We're going to make her sit there and watch cars go by. Nothing bad's going to happen. And that was my intention. And Basically, because I listened to the dog, I realized by even though this is what I was thinking, I was wrong. This dog would not do it. This dog would shut down. It was, guys, it was heartbreaking watching this. Um, so on the fly, I go with my instincts. I go with my gut a lot. I took this dog and I walked into somebody else's driveway. I don't even know whose it was. We're in a neighborhood. And I went about 15 feet into the driveway and I just stopped there with the dog facing the street. And we watched cars go by for about 10, 15 minutes. I don't even know how long we did it. And she reacted. And I kind of disagreed with it. You know, no, there's no reason to react like that. And I just waited her out. And it was a time. I, I'm going to tell you, it was about 10, 15 minutes, 15 feet away for her just to chill out while the cars were going by. I mean, that's how bad she was. And... After I realized, okay, we got two or three cars that went by and she really didn't react the way she was. And I was like, yeah, that's a good thing. I praised, praised, praised her. Uh, at this point, for all these people that talk about, you know, positive reward and giving treats, this dog, I'll tell you now, was so shut down. There is no way food would have motivated her. There's just no way. So that's where I kind of disagree with some of the other methods of training. Um and after she, I realized I got three or four cars or whatever it was that passed us and she didn't react, I walked about another five feet closer to the road. Still stayed in somebody's driveway. Um, 
And we went through the same process again with the same consistency. My energy never changed. I stayed the same. And I let her build confidence, not only in the situation with the cars gone by, confidence in me as her handler, that, hey, girl, I ain't going to ever put you in a position that's going to hurt you or scare you. Let's just get through this together. We did it basically hand in hand, if that makes sense, or par in hand. Um, and repeated the same process. After I saw she wasn't reacting, when we were 10 feet away, I went five feet away to the point where I was able to stand at the end of the driveway and cars went by and she was fine. And each one of those five feet intervals I did, the reactions were less and less. It didn't take 10, 15 minutes. When I moved to 10 feet, it may have taken five minutes. And when I moved to the end of the driveway, it may have only taken two minutes because she realized that, okay, this can happen and nothing bad and nothing scary bad is happening to me. So she learned to trust me, learned to trust the situation. And eventually we started walking down the road. And every time I saw a car come, coming in our direction or heard a car coming behind me, I would just go back to the, to the, the road grassway because there were no sidewalks where I was walking. And we would just stop and we'd watch the cars go by. And she eventually just kept going with the flow with the walk. And we walked around the block and then on the when we walked around the block to make the big circle, the road that we had to come back on was a major, major road. And that was going to be interesting because now we got, instead of one or two cars, maybe a minute, we had cars coming by every second. Uh, and we had motorcycles coming by. We had trucks coming by. We had a lot of things that can be terrifying. Now, that one happened to have a sidewalk. And what amazed me is the quarter of a mile, whatever it was, from one road to the next that we had to make the next turn at, she just went with me. But it was the key was the consistency that I gave from the time I realized, hey, my normal process isn't working. Let's try something else. I stayed consistent with my energy, consistent with the same discipline or whatever corrective measures I was taking every time she reacted to a car and the praise when she didn't react and she got it. And where I say consistent is a great. It worked for me. Now the hard thing was, is getting it to work for the owner. And because the owners have that emotional bond more so with the dog than I do, it took them a lot longer. And what was happening is they were getting frustrated with the process. And that's, and so instead of doing that, they wouldn't go to the major road. They, they avoided the situation and that's not consistency. Consistency is same routine, same thing day in, day out. And the reason you have to do that is because the more you do that with your dog, the longer this new method is wired into their brain and they move forward and they help you move forward. Um, she's doing real good now. They kind of changed up the game plan and it's working. They staying consistent. They're staying consistent with everything. This girl's scared of everything, not just the cars. I mean, she was just paranoid of everything. Uh, but the same discipline worked. So if she was afraid of sounds, we do the same thing. We, we generate the sounds that make her afraid. And you can do this, but you got to take the time. And the worst thing that we do as humans is we put time frames on things. You know, anybody who's had a, a dog knows nothing is, nothing is quick. Nothing is quick in this world. You have to take the time to do it. And just because you had one chocolate lab and it, it picked up everything and it was super smart and it did everything I told it once and it knew it, if you get another chocolate lab, it may not, and it probably won't be the same. Each dog is an individual and it's real, real important that you got, we understand that and we go by what that dog is telling us. They communicate to us a lot. We just have to understand what they're saying. And that's why I talk about energy so much. The energy is the crucial thing. It is the way we communicate with the dogs every single time. Their energy is communicating to me. My energy is communicating to them. They tell you a lot. And that's why I say dogs normally don't have bad behaviors. They have unwanted behaviors. And they're unwanted because we have to teach them a new way of doing it. And if the way you did it with, you know, Spike four years ago, and now you're working with Fido and Fido's not getting it, then change your way. It's not working. It's a different child, different dog. You have to learn to adjust to what your dog is actually communicating to you. And that's why I say it. aggression is, dogs are not born aggressive. Aggression is an outcome of an issue that was not properly addressed. 
most aggression comes from two causes, overexcitement and fear. And fear is also something that was addressed not properly because dogs aren't born fearful. Why this dog was afraid of cars never crossed my mind while I worked with her or after or before. It didn't cross my mind because it doesn't matter. Why are they afraid of the cars? Who cares? My job, my goal is to show them there is no reason to be afraid of that car. How do I stop digging? Digging is usually a mentally frustrated type of situation, Kathy. Um, from my experience, what I see, dogs that dig up in yards are usually mentally frustrated. They're usually a higher energy dog that's mentally frustrated. What I mean by that, we're not challenging their minds enough. Um, I always refer back to Master in the Walk, Back to Basic Style on my YouTube channel. It's called How to Leash Train My Dog. It's all about the structure and the leadership. Uh, it challenges their brains a lot more. The, and when they're not mentally frustrated, they don't destroy things. Dogs, you know, that usually dig up a yard unless they're a scent-driven dog. Uh, and what I mean by that is, you know, dachshunds that are might, you know, burrow, go after crit critters that burrow. Those are normal instincts. Those are a little harder to break. But if it's just the normal dog that's digging up the yard, it's usually because they're mentally frustrated um yeah i forgot where you said you were kathy let me run back up here upstate new york so you know you got a lot of critters um you know moles voles you know things that burrow into the ground so a lot of times they'll pick up the scent of that uh and it's appetizing but again if they're mentally challenged um it's the new girl one year old and, and now the 14 year old yeah well she can do it i can do it um uh, I hate to say it that way, but that's reality. Uh, my first question would always be, do you do a structured walk with them? I know the biggest problem I had on Long Island and upstate is the same thing. We have big backyards. That's what I always hear. We don't need to walk the dogs. You still need to walk the dogs. The, dogs, the walk is not about physical. It's about mental. The more we mentally challenge our dogs, the less destructive behavior they're going to have because they're going to be too mentally tired to do it. And if they do do the unwanted behavior after a good long walk, your corrections are quicker because they're too tired to fight with you. And a mentally, Oh, you, I you live on Long Island. Ooh, nice. So, you know, walking is crucial to the dogs. It's a mentally challenge. That's why I always refer. And if you haven't watched my, subscribe to my YouTube channel, folks, please subscribe to my YouTube channel, Back to Basics Dog Trainer. Look for the logo. Uh, you take them to the park, but is it the park to run or is it the park for a structured walk? Because remember, walking, there's two different types of walks. Walking where the dog is doing all this and out in front and running to smell everything and doing all that is not structured. You're not challenging the brain. Structured walk is dedicating the time to the heel. You're with me. You're following my directions. Then giving them time to smell people. No, on a 20 foot leash, 20 foot leash is guys. Think about it. The dogs 20 feet in front of you doing whatever the hell it wants. It's making all the decisions. You have to dedicate some time in a structured walk to do the heel process. And that should be longer than the 20 foot leash running around smelling pee and pooping. You need to challenge their brain more. When they're running in front of us, they're, no, they're not challenging the brain. They're following their nose, which is what dogs do. They're smelling things. They're controlling everything. They're not thinking about what you want. And I hate saying it this way because I sound like I'm really insensitive, but you're not relevant. They're 20 feet in front of you. You ain't relevant. Um, you know, and again, I'll use my dog Zoe. I walk Zoe a lot of times off leash. She will never get more than 10 feet in front of me without looking for where the hell I am. And that's what you want your dog to do if you ever do have an off leash experience. So you are more relevant in the dog's life, but that took time. Uh, what if you're handicapped and can't walk? Um, great question, John. If you can't, there's other things you can do. It depends on the, uh, on the severity of your own handicap and what equipment is available to you. One of the things I love doing, she does, doesn't does listen to me laugh out loud. Now I know why. Yeah, absolutely. She's in charge. Um, so, Kathy, if you haven't already, John, I'll get to your question in a second. Kathy, if you haven't already, 
uh, please find my YouTube channel, back to basics, dog training.com. You'll see that logo. I am so bad at this pointing thing, you, but you got it. You know where it is. Uh, look for my logo. Um, find that and subscribe. I need more subscribers guys. So help me out here. Uh, find my playlist, how to leash train my dog in five easy steps and follow it and do that consistently. And you'll see some of these unwanted behaviors just disappear. That's how important the walk is, guys. Uh, John, so to, again, again, depending on the severity of the handicap, um, if you can't really walk, do a structured walk with the dog, one of the things I like doing, if you have the equipment available, is treadmill training with the dog. Uh, again, I don't know if you have that equipment available to you. Um, is Treadmill training is good because it challenges not only them physically, it challenges them mentally. Uh, can you repeat? I lost you. I'm still here. Um, uh, basically, what I was saying is if you haven't subscribed to my YouTube channel, I am so bad at this pointing thing. Um, YouTube channel, subscribe to it. Uh, find my playlist, How to Leash Train My Dog in Five Easy Steps, and follow it. Master the walk. That's what that should be called, but it's not a Google friendly thing, so I don't call it that. Um, and do more structure with your girls to teach them, hey, I'm the most relevant thing in the world. You're going to follow my directions. Yes, I'm going to give you time to have recess. But if you follow those five easy steps and master each step of the five easy steps, you'll see a huge change. You'll become so much more relevant in their world. Uh, so again, John, if you have the access to a treadmill for your dog, that's be phenomenal that i do recommend getting a trainer because it will scare the crap out of your dog in the beginning um, um definitely do treadmill training if you don't have access to treadmill we can come up with different solutions to challenge their minds more um all dogs should have a good sense of smell so one of the things i like to do is I want to challenge their brains and you got to be careful because this is food related and I don't want dogs being, you know, obese, um, is I call it the shell game. If you can manage to do something where you can take three cups, put a treat on the one dog touches with the nose, they get the treat. So it's making them think, where is this thing going? You move it around. If they pick it up and they don't, if they touch the wrong one with their nose, they don't get the treat. And it makes them start thinking, oh, okay. Let me figure this out. But don't do it with a lot of excitement because, again, we don't want excitement. You can do this in a calm manner and you do this cup game. You can do it with your hands. Put a treat in one hand. Let them figure out which hand the treat is in. If they get it, good. They get it. If they don't get it, well, well, we start over. Um, there's just different things. Anything to do with challenging the brain. Um, one of the things you can do to challenge the brain to, and to make you more relevant is, and this is where if you're handicapped and you don't have the mobility, you can use a 20-foot leash in the house or a 10-foot leash, depending on how big your house is. Have the dog sit. You go distance away from the dog. And until you release your dog on a verbal command, they're not allowed to move. If they move, you're going to do your correction. Nope. Try to get them back to that where this started. And we start the process over. So you're becoming more relevant. They're thinking, okay, when are you going to release me? They be, start becoming more tired They're, because their brain is working. And like us, the more you use your brain, the tired you are. Um, and that's one way to challenge them. If you're handicapped and you use a wheelchair or a scooter or one of those carts or whatever, that's something that the dog should be trained to walk next to. Walk with you. Go with you. It's same as if you if you're walking. The you know the wheelchair or the cart is replacing you know your legs at that point. And I, I and I hope I'm not coming off insensitive here because I'm not trying to. Um, is they should be trained that the motion of the cart or the wheelchair represents the same as me walking. And you have to be calm on that. So it would be the same steps. The only difference is, is if you're in a car or wheelchair to give them the recess, it's not like you can just follow them all over the place. And that's the, one of the only times I like retractable leashes. Um, and what you can do with that, and I tell people all the time, you can take two different leashes on your walk. You can take your normal six-foot walking leash to do the structure 
And then if you choose to, because you're going to give them a little bit more freedom, clip on a retractable leash, let them do what they want to do, as long as they have a good recall to come back to you and they're not going to drag you. Uh, but if, if you're using tools to help you get around, you can utilize those tools to help to do the structure walk still. Uh, they shouldn't be afraid of a cart or a wheelchair. As a matter of fact, in my storage unit, once I get a facility, I have you know the metal walkers uh, because I want to train dogs to get used to walking with those because those are weird. Um, eventually, I do want to get wheelchairs and carts into it so I can teach dogs that it's okay to be next to these things. They're not gonna we're not gonna run your paws over. It's that trust thing, uh, John. I hope that answered your question. Um, Thank you. I, I walk with a cane. So it should be the same thing. Even if you're walking with a cane, John, the cane gives you the balance and the dog has to respect. So that cane itself, that, that tool, has to represent calm to the dog. No excitement when we see another dog. No nothing. Because if they're pulling you and you're, you need the cane for balance, they can knock you out of your tuchus too quick. So... You really want to everything be based on calm with the dog when you're dealing with with, with, with physical disabilities, um, and it's real, real important that, that and that's where calm energy is going to play the game, is going to make this because if you teach your dog every time we're out together, even during that recess period where you're giving them more freedom, that has to represent calm because if there's too much pressure on that leash, you can get hurt, and if you get hurt, you can't help your dog. He gets excited when he knows we're going out. I make him calm down before I open the door. Yeah, he gets excited before you go out, and which is great that you're making him wait the threshold management. But if he gets excited when he sees that leash, don't put the leash on him because you're rewarding his excitement. Of the, that, that, that rope with the clip on it is representing excitement, and it's a freaking rope. It shouldn't represent excitement because that sets us up for, Sets them up and sets us up for failure. So if they're overly excited seeing that rope, don't put the lead, don't put it on them because they're too excited. And again, if they're excited before you even get out through the door to the door, it's harder to break the patterns. Break the pattern the moment you take that leash out. If they get excited, don't put the leash on unless you know they have to go potty. I mean, they're game on because I don't want potty potty in my place. Um, but Again, episode one is all about that. Put the leash on the dog when the dog is in a calm state of mind. What do I do? Hold it in my hand. Hold it in your hand. Go sit down. Make him come over to you and say, hey, well, why aren't you putting the leash on me? Because now all of a sudden you became relevant. Think about it. You know, and I use the word relevancy a lot. I may misuse it, guys. I'm not an English major. Oh, excuse me. But if you take out this leash, this rope, and the dog becomes excited, what's more relevant? You or the leash? So by stopping the whole process, oh, you got excited, you can say no to the excitement, go sit down, and when they come over to you and say, uh, what the hell's going on? Now you become irrelevant because they're looking at you like, well, what the hell? Sit. Start putting the leash on. If they get excited, stop. Make them earn the leash being put on. It's hard because as humans, we run out of patience real quick. Why aren't you getting this? It doesn't matter. Take the time. And then you'll find that trip from that chair to the front door or back door, wherever you're going out, is easier. The thresh, episode two, threshold management, will be easier. Three, four, and five will be easier because you controlled all that nonsense before you got out the door. But you have, when, when, that, when that leash is more relevant than the human behind the leash, we have a huge disconnect. We need to become more relevant. Most dogs, because as humans, we tend, especially when they're young and they're puppies, get them excited for the walk. We kind of set them up for failure. You want to go for a walk? You want to go for a walk? You want to go for a walk? We get them all excited. And then we can't stand the way they walk. So let's reverse the process, guys. John, let me know how it works out next, uh, not next week, because guys, remember I said I was going to say a couple times already 35 minutes into this. Uh, I will not be broadcasting next week. Um, I'll be attending a, a dog event down here next Saturday, but the following Saturday, we're going to be talking to Hope's mom. Hope was a rescue dog that was in a shelter for three years, and boy, has she changed. I'm going to let her mom tell you the story. 
uh, because that's right from the horse's mouth, for lack of better terms. So it should be a real, real interesting interview. Um, Jacqueline, my question is a bit off topic. My dog is a small eight pound Pekingese rescue and I'm his favorite person. Most people he growls at, runs and pounces on, and he will guard me at times. Um, he also is reactive on the leash. I'm having a baby in June and I am a little concerned how he will react to this and how to introduce him to the baby. It's not off topic. That's a great, great question. Uh, Michelle, I see you have a question. I will get to that in a second, too. So as far as I'm hoping I'm wrong, but I'm going to say it's probably little dog syndrome because it's an eight pound pick and he's when he when he when he acts like an idiot, you pick him up and you hold him and you soothe him when he's in the unsure state of mind in this growling, pouncing, reactive state of mind. One thing you have to start learning to do is disagree with him growling at anybody or being reactive. Again, even though he's an eight pound dog, follow my master in the walker, how to leash train my dog on my YouTube channel, because it goes a long way to even leash reactivity. If he growls at a person, it's not picking him up and saying, it's okay. It's only Bobby. Bobby's a good guy. And by the way, congratulations on the baby. Um, you don't do that because you're reinforcing the state of mind. So what I would do to set him up for success is people I know he growls at, I'd invite them over when he's on a leash. And when he growls, I would do a nope, sit. The person coming in who is there to help you should do the no look, no touch, no talk theory. They should come over to you and come over to hug you or say hi to you. If your dog reacts, you're going to check them up and say, absolutely not. No anger, no frustration, no nonsense. You don't need to explain to him why he shouldn't growl at Bobby. I know Bobby's a good guy. Dog doesn't care. As far as conditioning a dog for a baby, guys, I have a couple steps that I, I, I suggest to anybody. One, start downloading the sounds now. Start downloading them of babies crying, cooing, laughing, giggling, whatever. And start playing those sounds first on a low volume and then work them up to normal baby crying levels. Because you want that sound to represent calm. Because that's a new sound to these dogs. They don't understand it. It could freak out some dogs. Uh, the other thing I do tell people to do when you're setting up the baby's nursery, the baby's room, whatever, do not allow your dogs in there un uninvited. And in the beginning, I wouldn't let them in there at all, personally. Uh, don't let them in there, especially if they're not invited in. Use that as a threshold management technique. Uh, you invite them into the room and they're in a calm state of mind. I play those sounds in that room. Um, it's real, real important that they understand that that room is off limits unless we give them permission to be in there. It could become a, a, a not a bad situation for the necessarily the baby, but for mom and dad, because I've read stories about dogs that sleep underneath cribs and everybody thinks it's cute and great, but actually the dog's doing that to protect the baby and then the baby cries in the middle of the night. Mom and dad come staggering in and the dog goes to attack because they're doing their job. So keep the room off limits. Download sounds, do that. Couple of other things I would say, get your stroller, get your stuff that you need now that you're gonna do your normal walk with and start walking your dog with that without the baby in it. Because the stroller may scare the dog, that motion may intimidate the dog. Start representing the stroller is calm and the dog always is behind the stroller. This is crucial guys. Keep the dog behind the stroller. This way the baby, the infant is the pack leader because it's in front and that's crucial. The other thing I tell people to do, the normal routine once a baby is born is mom's in the hospital, dad comes home or a relative comes home with the swaddle, at first swaddling blanket, and they put it right in the dog's face. Smell this. That's the baby. Get used to it. I don't necessarily agree with that. I keep space around that smell. So I'll go, remember, dog's sense of smell is much better than ours. I will stay about three feet away from the dog. So the dog's like, what the hell is that? Holding the blanket. And if they get too close to it, I disagree with it calmly. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I want that smell to represent space. So this way, when you come home from the hospital and the baby, you know, dog's all excited. Oh, baby. Oh, I got to give that space. And this way, if you're sitting on the couch and you're feeding the baby, you don't have to worry about the dog coming into the baby's personal space. Eventually, you can invite the dog into the baby's personal space, but the dog shouldn't make the decision to be in the baby's personal space. And if you think about that, that is back 
to basics, back to nature. When puppies are born, no other pack member is allowed near those puppies. Mama will take care of that. Mama demands their personal space for those puppies. You're going to demand personal space for your puppy. I hope that made sense. Um, if you need more clarification on that, definitely let me know. That's something maybe we would want to do a Zoom on to really go in depth on that, uh, Jacqueline. That's something we can definitely do. Uh, Michelle says, I have a chihuahua mix, fearful of everything. If ice drops in the refrigerator, he jumps. Noise and motion scare him. Reactive outside on leash, off leash in dog park, scares hide. In city, scared. Uh, down the shore, relax. Well, I'm, I'm, down, I'm more down relaxed when I'm on the shore too than in the city. Um, okay, so again, we want to desensitize them to things. Pick one one thing that is, you know, you, you use the ice dropping. What I would do is see if you can find sounds on it. Either that or record that sound on your phone. Keep your dog on a leash and play the sound. First at a very, very low volume. And then when you don't see a reaction, praise, 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 praise. And then slowly increase the volume. And every time they don't react, praise. When they react, you can disagree. You're allowed to say no because we know that's not necessary, that fear. Um, and you slowly descend some. When you Guys, when you're dealing with fear, there is absolutely no quick fix. In the very beginning, Michelle, when I talked about that dog that was afraid of cars, it's the same theory. You got to go through that same process with sounds. I've done this with dogs that are afraid of thunder and fireworks. I download the sounds, we play them, and we desensitize them to it. But the key is watch your timing. When you see clink of the, the, the ice falling and um, the he doesn't react, praise, 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 because you want to time that really good. Um, so this way he knows, oh, I heard that sound and I got praised. If he's food motivated, give him a treat, small treats, healthy treats preferably, because um, you want him that sound to represent it's okay. Same thing with motion, same thing with movement, noises. You want to desensitize him. But what I would usually do is pick the thing that he's what you consider he's most afraid of, and work on that hard because that may take away those underlying. Okay, so if it's food motivated, every time he doesn't react to that clink of the ice, praise and give the treat. Eventually, we wean away from the treats, of course, because otherwise he's going to be, you know, a chihuahua mix that weighs as much as a St. Bernard. Uh, you know, but praise, praise, praise. And your energy is going to tell him a lot. Guys, remember, you don't need to do the treats. I say for food, for fear, you can use them. But your energy, if you're truly happy with what your dog is doing, <laughs> they're going to know that that's the best treat in the world for them. So you can do all those things. As far as reactivity on the leash, definitely, again, watch my videos, guys, because you got to take away all those, anything but a calm state of mind. We're always going to reward that calm state of mind that is so crucial to your dog's survival, to your sanity, everything. Reward their state of mind Watch it, time it properly, and you'll have huge success. John says, okay, he usually, um, he will always, at, wait, whoa, let me get back here, Jacqueline. Okay, thank you. He will usually at times go airborne on leash trying to attack. He's much worse on leash if I introduce him to people. He likes only me and my husband, which is problematic, but I will try. Don't try, guys. I say this all the time. Just do it. And the reason... I'll put a link in in the descriptions on the Facebook pages um, to my YouTube channel. Remember, please subscribe. I need subscribers. Um, Jacqueline, one of the things I'm going to say is it's timing on your corrections. Most people wait for the explosion to make the correction. They give us warnings. It's never, there's always a warning. And that's why I said, if you can do it more in a controlled environment, have a friend come over, meet him in the yard, meet him, you know, in the, you know, in a, a neutral place. As this person is approaching your dog, start watching your dog. As soon as you see that little bit of a change in body language, nope, disagree with it there. Don't wait for the explosion. Because if you wait to, he's airborne, 
good freaking look correcting it. It's too hard. His mind is gone at that point. So you want to catch the mind at a lower level. You got to be aware of what he's telling you. And that's why I said they communicate to us all the time. If you ever want, guys, and I offer this to anybody, I'm going to put my contact information up here. Um, somewhere down here. I think that's me. Last time I checked, that's me. Um, if you get it on video, send it to me. Because I can tell you, you know, where you may have missed your signal that the dog is telling you. But look for the little bit of change. So if the dog's normally a happy-go-lucky, nobody's around me. I got mommy and daddy, my, my favorite people in the world. And I'm walking and I'm going. Oh, shh. Somebody's coming. Boom. Right there. Correct. No. Sit. Because you're catching them at a lower state of mind. On that 0 to 10 scale, you may be catching them at a 3. If you wait for the lunge, they're in an 8 or 9. Good freaking luck. It's hard. Guys, it's hard. Don't wait that long. Catch it early. Because now you're disagreeing them when you have more of their attention. What should happen, if you time this properly, when you see that going from this, and all of a sudden you see that little change, because... Stranger danger, and you correct them with a firm enough pop of the leash without hurting them or scaring them, and a firm no, they should look at you like, What the hell? Sit. That's when you have your opportunity to say, eh -eh, No more of this nonsense. As far as if you're, again, and you have to think of the positive, don't think of the negative, don't think about the what ifs, think what you want. Visualize what you want, because if you visualize, He's going to do this. The odds are he's going to do it because you're going to get tense. You're going to get frustrated. You're going to get whatever human emotion. You have to stay calm. And as far as then with the baby, another thing you can do is buy a lifelike baby that actually crawls and makes noises and stuff. You know, a doll. Don't buy a baby. That's kind of came out wrong. Buy a doll and hold it like you would. Let it crawl around. Let it make noises. And it, it keep going on every time. Nope. Nope. But no anger, no frustration. People worry when I say this that we're going to create a negative. But the only way you're going to create the negative that the baby represents a negative is if you're angry and you're frustrated. If you stay calm, that no-nonsense approach. No, it's a baby. It's allowed to be here. You'll see that they'll calm down quicker. And once they calm down and they don't react to the, the doll crawling, Praise, praise, praise. It's the best thing in the world. They're going to actually associate that crawling with, oh, my God, look at that. That thing is crawling, and I'm getting all this praise. Yay, I must be the best thing in the world. I'm better than that. <laughs> so I hope that makes sense. It's real, real careful. And, again, guys, even the most balanced dog in the world, you know, Zoe, when I walk her and we see babies walking around here, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of what's going on. I'm not worried about what's going on but i do keep a more a closer eye on her when she goes near the stroller or whatever and goes to introduce herself to, i introduce her to the baby because they're animals they can make mistakes so especially in the beginning but don't sit there oh my god I may attack she may attack the baby he may attack the baby no trust Lee should be your best friend at this time jacqueline i hope i'm saying your name right by the way um the leash should definitely be your best friend when the baby is born. Um, you also are going to have a problem. Um, based on the conversation, I'm going to say it's the first, first baby. You're going to have a lot of people coming over to see the baby. So we definitely want to start inundate, not inundating, but bringing people to your home now. So the sound of knock on the door, the ring of the doorbell starts representing calm too. We may want to go further in detail on this, uh, Jacqueline. We definitely can think about doing a Zoom. Zoom is a very affordable way of training. Um, because I talk one-on-one -on -one about your issues, not a plethora of issues like we talk about here. Um, we can definitely do something about that if that if you're interested in that to really go into detail. And I do believe that at that point your husband should be involved because this way we're all on the same page, which will help your dog because that's part of the consistency. So, guys, great questions this week. Let me know next uh, next week. Remember, I'm not going to be here next week, guys. Uh, I'll put something out probably Saturday morning. Just people remember uh the week i will be here doing a live interview with a uh, with hope's mom hope was in a shelter for three years uh and how we can um 
how even after three years we were able to help this dog have this happy balanced life that they want they we want i probably need some sort of help with you would definitely be interested in that thanks yeah just reach out to me my numbers are hey look at that i actually did that one pretty good uh down here best thing is text me or email me at info at back to basics dog training.com or text me at the phone number um oh good morning michelle i didn't know you were watching today um but we can definitely help you so it, like i said next week won't be here guys the following week i will it'll be a great interview so please get, get that one out to all your friends and rescues and i'll i'll remind you because i'm going to blast this one out all over as much as i can because i definitely think uh this one will help our people and our rescues and our foster people to do a wonderful job but i think they need some guidance so we're going to help them out a little bit uh with that being said guys we're going to start wrapping it up um if there's no other questions of course if there's other questions i will be happy to answer them and if you have questions now or later on you think of something write them in the comments i get back to those as well but with that being said guys thank you for inviting me into your home each and every saturday morning i really do appreciate it. it's an honor to be here and as always stay healthy stay safe god bless and remember together we can have one dog and one family at a time Enjoy the rest of your weekend, guys.